welcome to this conversation with John Velasco. I've been in the entertainment business for a very long time. Uh, I'm from England, which I hope you can tell. Mm -hmm. I moved to America like, uh, God, 30 years ago. I came for two years and I'm still here. But uh, no, and uh, you know, I've been in a whole different, I started with a guy called Jimmy Webb. I wasn't even in the music business. And then uh, he came to town, I was introduced, we made friends and, uh, you know, he's an amazing composer and we had a company together and I worked with him for a few years and we had so many hits because of what he does that, uh, you know, I sort of, people thought I knew what I was doing and I really hadn't got a clue. <laughs> but uh, no, so, so that was really my start. And I, you know, that's why I've really stayed with music and production, whatever I do, it look, may look like I'm doing a whole bunch of different things but really everything is music, whether it's a movie, TV, it's all based from music up. And because uh, anyway, that's the heart of the whole industry, wherever you go, you need the music. And you know, being a horrible musician myself, where I can play piano with one hand and I play guitar badly. And it's like, so I just love being around people that are really talented. Mm -hmm. So I live my care to them. So, uh, yeah. And that's it. You know, I've been lucky enough to, you know, be involved with a lot of major acts and uh, run, you know, major companies like United Artists. I came across here with CBS. And uh, so I've had a very career doing a whole bunch of different things. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. I mean, one thing I did, I, which is probably the best thing in my mind I did, I did the first ever tour of India with a music, uh, with a band, which took me a year living in India to put it all together because it had never been done before. So that was, if you like, the biggest adventure I ever had. <laughs> wow, it sounds like you must have millions of stories. Have you written a book yet? No, people keep saying I should, but you know, it's, it's a lot of the best stories I could never put in there. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, I, I just think it's it's nice and I could probably wouldn't remember everything. It, it's nice going to festivals and things and I'll meet someone and say, do you remember when? And I remember it, you know, it's uh, it's it's so much stuff. You know, I've just been very lucky and done a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, even being in Sweden with ABBA. I mean, that was a fun situation by accident. <laughs> and by so things accident? Like, yeah, I mean, I was the, I was my publisher in Sweden was Stig and wonderful guy and uh, he had this band ABBA in, into the Eurovision Song Contest so I, I signed them and uh, it was funny we were the only company that didn't bring the band in ahead of the contest even. I just had a video and I showed the video my party was a press party showing them the video and uh, it was really funny I mean they were in it we had no clue they would even win it and I, on the night, I remember I was sitting there watching it and actually I was talking to someone behind me and they said, I don't believe you're so far ahead right now. And I, I had no clue. And I turned around and I thought he was joking. And, you know, that was obviously the beginning of a lot of fun. And I was lucky enough to travel to Stockholm virtually once a month to sit with Stig and the guys in the studio and hear what they were doing. And it was, uh, it was a really fun time. That is so neat. And, uh, oh, man. My mom has loved Ab Abba her whole life. Like uh, it's like the anthem of that from her childhood that's followed her her entire life. <laughs> no, that's love. Well, I know a lot of people that feel way. And it, the fun thing is, you never know at that moment what you're really involved in. Mm. Who would know? It would go on and on and on. Like a lot of the bands I've been involved with. I see that they're still going today and it's amazing. Some of them you had no clue they would be there. And it, so it's nice, the nice thing looking back, realizing that, yeah, that did happen. So and, uh, you must have this gift of just knowing when people have a secret sauce, that they're just, there's something special about them. I don't know. I mean, I like people basically, and I keep it a very small people that bring me things and my, lump of people I really trust gets smaller and smaller and I, a lot of it is luck it really is you can mm. work as hard as you like <clears throat> and it's true a lot of the bands I've been involved with it's just totally by luck it's just being in the right time meeting the right person at the right minute and that's what I tell everyone when they're talking about 
hit singles and everything, no matter how much money you put behind an act and how much time you spend, you can't tell what the public's going to do. If you go, everyone would be a hit. It's uh, so you, you can do like 90%, but that little 10% of the publishing public, that's who decides really what's going to be a hit. And it's interesting to see how it goes along. I mean, I've seen people become hits that I had no clue they would. So it just shows how clever I am. And I would say, no, that's ridiculous. I mean, years and years ago, when I was running United Artists Music, then it's uh, someone brought me an act with a girl in a, a garbage bag called poly polystyrene. And I sort of laughed. I thought it was a joke. And this guy Falcon is a friend of mine. was saying, no, no, we're going to make it a big hit. So obviously I turned it down and she was a big hit. She was like one of the beginning of that punk era thing. So like I say, you, you've got no clue what's going to be a hit. And in the end, yeah, it was a really fun idea. But, you know, so another thing is don't take yourself too seriously, I think, because it just shows you're going to look at everything. Because that was another thing the public just loved that polystyrene thing. <laughs> you never know. It might, you must have seen so many changes in the music industry over the years. Yeah, it's interesting. It's really like the song, the big wheel keeps on turning, though, you know. And I, I think, you know, and it's almost you see that it starts with country, folk, if you like, country songs with meanings then it turns into country rock then it turns into rock and then it gets harder and harder through metal to something totally different and at that point you, you know you don't know what's going to happen from hip-hop to rock, whatever but then much like it's happening now guess what the songs come back and now it goes back to country and if you look there's a whole renaissance in the whole country area and you really now can't really differentiate between pop and country and rock, it's it's music. And that's what I, I say to a lot of people now, the, the whole genre thing is, guess what music this is? It's a, a really diffuse line there now, it's music. Mm. Uh, it, it's to put it into a, a, a column is very tough now. Yeah. So, so what music is your favorite? I mean, that's where it, you know, that's part of the whole thing. I mean, I love Billie Eilish. I love, I go back to, obviously, I love the old music, Glenn Miller. I mean, it's so wide. And I love people that do things with that old stuff. There was a, a band um, that did all the Glenn Miller songs in rock, almost hip hop, which is fantastic. And so it's, again, it's just be, I like people being creative. I don't like people... It happens a lot, you know, with, with the the, um, the sampling and everything. They try and sound like someone else. And, and that's very sad. I mean, I'd rather it be a really average record, but really unique than something, okay, yeah, it sounds like a hit. What does a hit sound like? You, you don't know until you put it out there. And to me, if you're copying the vocal work and everything else, you know, if you get a hit, it's fine, but it's not really your hit because you just copied the sound of the moment. Right. And, and I see that that happening an awful lot as well. Mm. My, my son's got a single out right now, which is like, it, it's uh, it's in, in, what's it called? It's, it's an industrial type sound. And, and a lot of people love that type of stuff, but you know, it's it amazes me when I hear what he can play and what he can do, if you like, with melodies and stuff. And then you hear something that isn't. So it, it's, uh, I just like people doing whatever they want to do. But it, the secret, I think, is they have to believe in what they're doing. Mm. You can always tell the difference from someone just singing a song to someone really singing a song, where they're thinking about what they're singing and they're putting feeling, whether it's rock or whatever, it's that emotion. Yeah. You can't really hide that. Yeah. There's this song by Martina McBride, Do It Anyway. And right. there's this recording of her singing it. And it's just like this, this force went through the audience that she was feeling what she was singing. Like people will let you down. Life will hurt. Love will get spat back in your face, but do it anyway. And everyone was just silent and just awe from how much she poured out. That's just, don't you just live for those kind of moments? Yeah, and I think, you know, something, it's really cathartic for the artist, for the singer, they getting something out there. And I think it's good for a lot of young artists. And, you know, they've got these things deep inside them, which are troubling them, maybe. Get it out. 
And, uh, you know, I know quite a few um, that, have, that have had terrible things happen in their lives and they've got over it when they've thought about it through music. And it is the big healer when you think about it as people with terrible mental, mental conditions and things. Music is the thing that brings them out, that eases them, that helps them. Yeah. And it's the, like the Nordoff Robbins um, charity is wonderful what it does with music for children and everyone else. And it's, uh, it's a, great, a great, you know, emotional conduit, if you like. Totally. That, that's why it reaches you. I, I never listened to Pink Floyd at all growing up, but I recently had the opportunity through Eileen to speak with Scott Page. So uh -huh. I was like, well, I think I better listen to some of his stuff before I talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> and I listen, and one of the songs in particular, just like, I want to listen to this song every week. Like it's uh -huh. um, on the turning away. I'm not sure. But it's like such a powerful, powerful lyrics song yeah. about don't be a part of the problem of turning your back on people who are in need. When will we start to see each other? And it's just, I, oh, so deep. Well, a lot of those bands in that era, if you look at the lyrics, they were really saying something. Yeah. And, you know, it wasn't just the melodies. It was, they were all very heartfelt. A lot of that stuff coming out. It's, uh, I, I think you're quite right. If people go back to some bands that they would think, oh my God, I'm not going to listen to those. And actually listen to them, Black Sabbath and things like that, you'll be surprised. I mean, one of the uh, tracks of Black Sabbath is a song called Fluff, which is about a lovely disc jockey in England from years ago. And it's like a classical piece. It's a beautiful, and you would never guess that that's from, you, it could be a great party thing, play it to someone, they would never guess it was Black Sabbath playing that piece. So you never know. I mean, I'm working with Rick Wakeman again now, you know, from Yes, <clears throat> from back in years. And we're doing a fun sort of TV series, which we've just got on. And Rick really plays classical the piano so incredibly. And if you look up some of the stuff he's done, it, it's amazing when you think that people look at him as a rock keyboard player, or maybe a wonderful rock keyboard player. But then when you hear him, playing classical pieces and then really well-known songs in the classical manner. It, it's stunning. There's a lot more to these artists, almost every artist than you, you'd ever imagine. It's like they were put into these boxes by their PR people or whatever to, so that they would stand out and they would sell. And then they never like, oh, oh no, you can't do any other kind of music. <laughs> No, actually, that's, that's exactly right. That's why I say these lines are blurring. And, you know, if I'm dealing with the young artist, it's like my first thing is, who are you? Mm -hmm. I mean, who don't just sing a song. Who are you? And that's what's got to come over until they decide who they really are. They're all over the place, a lot of these people, because they're trying to get a hit record mm -hmm. rather than being themselves and seeing what the public think of them. Like wanting to make the money but it's like if it's about the money it's not gonna nobody's gonna feel anything oh oh yeah it's the toughest thing it's it's like no i mean and it's what you were saying earlier is that you feel it if you when someone is a great performer you feel their performance whether it's rock or whatever or whether it's ballad it's it is it's the emotion behind it and how it stirs it up in yourself yeah. i mean i think the only thing world I, the only thing I think that was outside of that was probably disco. <laughs> but when you look at it all, it's still about feelings. Yeah, it was the greatest fun era that I think ever was. It was like, just, there's no problems in the world. Let's have the greatest time. Let's just go out and have fun. So if you think about it as well, it didn't matter what the words were about. It was about going out and having fun. So in a way, it still goes into the emotional content of what was going on. It had been tough times before that. And it was like taking a breath and just partying. But uh, but all the most of the songs were nonsense. It was just great, you know what I mean? So if you like, that's the one thing I could think of that really doesn't fit into that, you know, has to be about something. <laughs> well, people get to the point, like I have a friend, she's actually doing press for um, Eurovision right now. Uh, and it's she's, she's just a YouTuber like me, so, it's like so funny that we're both getting these opportunities to talk to people in this world so far outside of our own. 
Um, but she's like, after this year that she's had, she's like, I don't want to have, I don't want to feel, I don't want to cry. I just want to dance. I just want to have fun. And I go. think maybe the seventies were a little bit like that. There was, there was a few things going on in the sixties and still in the seventies, obviously, but people just wanted to just shake it all off. hundred percent. And I'm seeing that a lot now. I mean, I've just been come off the phone three minutes ago about a big, uh, show going to be on in August and it's so wonderful that people are starting to put shows on again and it's you're desperate to go out and see a show and the bands are desperate to play and uh, so it's it's really an interesting moment that it's start that it's like the machine starting again but also during that whole time a lot of it was a great level of the whole time of the pandemic for artists I think where the difference between an artist that can be in front of 50,000, 100,000 people and someone playing in a bar, they were all suddenly, they weren't performing in front of anyone except through the Zoom or through the internet. So mm -hmm. that was a great level from that point of view, that uh, if you were inventive enough and it has happened a few times, you could actually break through. You know, it gave people a lot more chance to be inventive, which again comes back to the creativity of the artist. Yeah, that inherent ability to, as my friend David Hoffman says, make something good out of something bad. That, absolutely. And this is, uh, you know, this is almost like a reset for the industry, I think. Um, what's something that you would love to do? You know, that, that's a really tough question. It's, uh, I'm pretty do doing what I really like to do, you know, which is, is tough. I mean, it's like, I, I would love to see a couple of the artists I'm working with really break through. And uh, yeah, it's, I would really just like to keep on doing what I'm doing and enjoying the industry. Mm. You know, nothing really special I really want to do right now, which is love, strange. This is, this is something else I'm noticing of these conversations I'm having is people aren't stuck in this good old days mindset but they, 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 they stay young in their hearts because they love what they're doing in the here and now. And that is so cool. Yeah, I, I, someone told me the other day, a really interesting sort of little adage that there's a reason that the rear view mirror in the car is so small and the windscreen is so big. <laughs> it's don't look back, just you've got everything ahead of you, which mm -hmm. is a really interesting uh, yeah. thing. It's very true. Totally but it still exists. And I want to challenge you to tell stories, even if you think you might miss, leave something out. And even if you can't tell the best ones, because it's just a legacy to be able to, to share and pass down to the people that care and, and maybe some little warnings out there for the people that have no idea what they're jumping into. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, to me, People have got to remember, even if they're going to have fun with it, it's an industry like anything else. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to run into a lot of nasty people and a lot of nasty things. And some of them won't be on purpose. You just don't know what you're doing. And I think it's like anything else you enter into, you have to know what the business you're going to is about, at least the basics. You don't have to be clever about it, but you have to know about music publishing if you're a writer and how you protect yourself because that's where all your money is anyway. That's the entire bank of the industry. If you go running after records, that's fine, but you'll never earn as much selling a record as you will owning the music that the record. So, and it's, so it's learning those basics of yes, you should own this, you should own that. You don't give all the rights away. And once you learn, people are so, so desperate to get a record deal or a publishing deal or a hit they give away the farm and then God forbid they get a hit and they turn around and say, where's my money? And it's, well, you're earning this off your percentage of the record, but all the big money is going where it should, which to the publish where, and they haven't even got, or they've got a tiny 50% of what they should be earning. Mm. And it, it's so easy to find out what you should be earning. It's, it's everywhere. You can Google it, you can look up. And there's several great books out there, which will give you the basics, but I'm saying, it's just running into the industry to get a hit record and make lots of money. It isn't the way to do it. It's, it's like, I don't know. It's like being a driver of a crane on a big building site. And you're saying, I'd love to play that for fun and jumping in and doing it, you know, the best of luck. And it's, it's really as silly as that. 
it, it looks simple to write a song, sing a song, make a hit record and make lots of money, but it really doesn't work like that. It's so funny how everything is so similar because I'm a YouTuber and I've been doing this for two years and I, it takes a long, it's a marathon as well. And to even be monetized, you have to have 1000 subs and 4,000 watch hours. And that's pennies that you're making there. And there's so many people that show up and they're like, I've uploaded five videos and I've been doing this for three months and I still haven't gone viral. And why am I not monetized? Like, Yeah, you see, it's the same. It's an industry. And the guys that know how to do it, like you are fine. I mean, it's like, but again, you studied and found out what it was all about. Mm-hmm. What are some traps that artists fall into? Hmm. I, I, I mean, it's very difficult, it's like I said, by not knowing what they're doing. And then the types of traps are that someone will give them a bunch of money for a whole lot of rights. And they want the money right now. So they take the money rather than owning those rights and leasing the rights, if you like. It, it's it's basic music industry stuff is that if it, and basically it's the same in life if you have an asset and your songs are your assets why would you get rid of them at the beginning because you may need them as you get older to be you know your pension and it's so you know if you desperately need the money i understand but why not take a smaller amount of money and lease the rights if you like which is the best way i can describe it so you have enough money to help pay your rent, but in the meantime, you own the rights or you can lease them for a while. So the rights come back to you. And, I, and to me, that again, it is the basic thing is ownership of assets mm. is what the industry is about. And, was... and it's also getting a good team around you. And that's tough. Yeah, I was but... just about to say that the good team around you, not a bunch of yes men. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's funny because I sometimes apologize because I, I say what I think and I say, I'm sorry if you don't disagree. It's like, no, that's what I want to hear. And it it is, people have got to be honest, but uh, again, it's down to money. Some people are yes people because they want the money, they want the, the fee for doing what they do. Uh, but usually if you find one good person at the beginning, they will guide you through and build a team around you. Mm. And it's now with the internet and everything else. Luckily, you can actually find out about a person, quite a lot about a person, as you know, before you even get involved with them. Because again, there's a lot of young people, much like the people trying to be hits on labels, there's a lot of people trying to be hits as a manager or as an agent. Again, without doing really doing their homework. They may be as keen as you like and as nice as you, but if they don't know again their business, it can be your best friend trying to help you out but you've got to make sure that they've done their homework as well. Mm. It uh, sounds like there's a real vacuum in, in, in a way in the world of assets to teach people, help people discover who they are. Well, yeah, and that's what I said, that that to me is the first thing I'd always tell an artist, you know, find out who you are because, and the other, because God forbid they get a hit record and they hate the record they just did and they've got to be that person now for at least the next year probably and do another record like it. And that's happened a lot as well. If they start out with who you are, yes, you can be like a chameleon and gently change, but at least you're being yourself. And again, that leads back into being emotive when you sing a song. It goes back into, if you were you, it's very much easier to feel a lyric. Even if someone else has written it, if it's a song that really makes you feel things, that, that's where it comes from. And that's my son just gone across the background. <laughs> so do your kids think that you're super cool and, and ask to hear stories of your life? Not at all. But, but why would they? No, I mean, <laughs> it's not what you do as a kid, is it? <laughs> my son actually runs the music publishing part of my business. So he's doing that. And uh, I always say I've got three sons and only one went wrong. He went into finance. Because <laughs> the other, my other son has you know, a nice, nice record label in England. So, it's, uh, so I've got two in the industry and one in finance. <laughs> finance, how boring. He probably wears ties and everything. Well, the funny thing is he had a band and he was like 
very uh, creative. It always astonished me when he went into it, but it was like, that was fun. Now I'm going to be serious. It was like, okay. And I think the plan is to make as much money as he can. Then he'll have fun, <laughs> which is fine. Yeah. The more money he makes, the better presents he can get you for your birthday. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and he does. <laughs> oh, here's a good question, I hope. Have you ever declined working with an artist because of their attitude? Oh, thousands of times. Oh, yeah. I mean, so many times. It's, uh, and, and usually the comeback is, how can you do that? I'm wonderful. I mean, it's like, you get some people that have got such an ego at the beginning. Having an ego is important as an artist, but some people are just so over the top. They walk in and they, you know, they expect you to, they're so wonderful. How can you turn them down? And no matter what you say and how much, if you like, kind advice you give them, they won't believe it. I mean, and uh, no, I've seen that many times, unfortunately. You know, and I, I think as well, it's like their parents or whatever, their aunts or uncles have told them they're a wonderful singer. I mean, you've seen that on all these talent shows. People step up there and it's hysterical, but all their friends know they're the greatest singers that there ever was there. So it's, no, and they, they quite often, that's how it starts. Nowadays though, you know, I, I meet very few people as an artist, wise, unless they're introduced. And, uh, you know, because I, if they're introduced by someone I know, at least I know they're not gonna be a total dead loss and maybe we won't, won't get on or whatever. But, you know, I, I, ma I manage with very few people now anyway, because, uh, you know, I, I, you can't take on too many people at the same time. You've got to really be stuck. I mean, one of the artists I manage or a writer, I've managed him for over 30 years now. Randy Edelman, who funnily enough, uh, he was signed to, um, to Stig Anderson. We signed him there for a while. And we used to do all our recordings in Polo there in Stockholm. So, uh, and Randy now is probably, you know, one of the world's greatest um, composers for movies. You know, everything from my uh, cousin Vinny to the Mars to, I mean, you know, what's it? I've been just over 200 movies. And, uh, yeah, and basically we, we we started a lot of the career recording in Stockholm, which is funny. <laughs> and then we got lots oh, of stock. Wow. But uh, no, and and so I, I managed a young girl called April Rose Gabrielli, who was signed to BMG, uh, who's a super hard worker, the same thing, incredibly emotional songs, and everything is her. And so it's... Uh, like I say, it, it's it's down to really just taking someone you believe in and just working and working with them. And if you put it out too far, it doesn't work. I mean, I consult the people still, and it's basically down to showing them how how or their young manager how they should build their career, and really how to get the foundation of having, you know, the the, the business side of it set up before they move, and. Uh, but directing an artist is just, it's, it takes a lot of time. It's really time consuming. Can yeah. I ask a dumb question? What does, what is it exactly that you do in managing an artist? You really, if you like, become married to them. You're like a team. You really, you've got to understand how they think. They've got to understand how you think. So you can have really open conversations. Um, with there's sort of no nonsense in between. They know that whatever I say is going to be exactly how I feel, right or wrong, and they're going to tell me the same thing. And then you obviously come hopefully to an agreement somewhere in the middle, or you both agree it. And luckily, the artists I've got right now, we agree all the time, almost on everything, which is terrifying. And uh, but but the, the basic is that you really got to have a long term view. If you like, make a timeline. This is what we would love to happen. In the meantime, let's plan what we think will happen and do everything we can to achieve each step. And as I said, the first step becomes setting up you up business-wise in case you had a hit first off, but even if you don't, you need your business set up and the different entities within it. And, and then working out, like I said, to create a team that'll help you through each step of it. Um, you know, then booking at the right areas. Again, it's done through people you know to get them into the right show here or a support act there. And 
it's really having a like I say, sitting down with the eyes, having a long term view, and actually drawing out. This is where we'd like to be here and here. And uh, although we've had this whole year off now, I mean, the girl I, I managed to be doing a lot of online shows, one huge concert, which became one of the top 10 of last year. And she didn't stop. I mean, it's like, why would you stop? It's like I'm saying there were a lot of opportunities where you can still do a world tour, but it's virtual. It, uh, so if you, she didn't stop working for one minute. She was in there working, blogging, hitting the internet, you know, telling people how she felt and connecting with her artists, uh, with her fans, I mean, and building them. And so that really what it comes down to, again, is working the industry, working the business. And just because the industry stopped, it didn't really stop. It went on hiatus for live, but everything else was still out there. And, uh, you know, and, and I love it. And I love when I'm like, she'll chase me and say, what's happened? I said, did this happen? And, well, it's fabulous. So, uh, yeah, we, so, and again, it, like I say, it just comes back to the same thing. It's, it's a business partnership like any other business. It's not just artist and management. Thanks for explaining that. <laughs> I could have started, asked that a bit earlier. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got there. That's so easy to do, isn't it? Just nod your head like you know what people are talking about. <laughs> oh, oh, sure. Yeah, well, you do it very well. <laughs> so you've managed Tina Turner and what other what other amazing people have you worked closely with? Marvin Gaye. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, no, at, at the beginning, I was involved with Yes and Black Sabbath and Gentle Giant, which were really nice acts. Um, a lot of acts, um, ELO. Uh, and then Abra, of course, and I mean, there's been a lot of acts, but uh, and it's been, a, you know, it's a lot of fun with those mm -hmm. acts, and each of them for different reasons, you know, is, uh, and luckily the most of them were one, the sad thing was Marvin, because I mean, he was just starting to start all over again, and boom, gone, so that was one of the, the saddest things, because he, I mean, what an incredible talent he was, and uh, so, yes, no, oh. it's a, what? He was so, he was like, not even, he was in his 40s or something? No, he wasn't that old. I forgot how old he was, but he wasn't old at all. Oh. And he was a lot of stuff lined up for him as well. And he was, I think he was finally having fun again, which was, uh, but the, I mean, the, there's so many writers out there. I mean, writers as well that, you know, a lot of the public wouldn't know, like Joe Raposo, who was one of my closest friends. And uh, he, he was one of the creators of Sesame Street. Uh, he wrote all the songs for 20 years, virtually, apart from odd guest writers. And uh, he was an amazing chap. Imagine coming up every week with a new song. And, uh, you yeah, know, one of his great sayings was, you know, if only if, it would be terrible if the kids found out I was teaching them something. But when you think of all those songs, were just great little songs, but each one taught the kids something. And so... Uh, I mean, to me, he was one of the most amazing talents that was out there. And he's like, again, one of the ones in the background that hardly anyone would ever know his name. They know Jim Henson. And, jo and Joe actually brought Jim Henson into that whole thing. So it's, uh, you know, so they know that some of the names, but, you know, Joe was, like I say, he was like the, the, the foundation of that whole project. And, See, I would uh, love to have a conversation with, with all of these kinds of people the, the, the ones that, that didn't get the limelight, that have so many stories and have and that deserve to be remembered. Yeah, I mean, and the nice thing is a lot of those people, you know, you'll, uh, you know, they, you'll never even know about them. They said that Alan J. Lerner was another incredible composer I was lucky enough to work with. And, uh, you know, I asked him a silly question one day. I said, you know, what's your least favorite song you've ever written? And it took him two seconds. He said, Gigi. And I said, Gigi is an incredible song. How can you say that? And he said, I, I can't get it right. But he said, on all, everything I write, you have to know what the song's about by, I, it was like the 12th line or something. And the main line of Gigi, am I, am I too old, are you too young, doesn't come in until two lines later. And it bothered him all the time. So it was, it was just lovely little stories about these guys who, you know, Bob and Dick Sherman, who did, uh, oh God, uh, Mary Poppins and all those great songs. No one ever knew who they were and they never will. I doubt if they'll even notice the names, you know, on the credits. 
Mm. They're incredible writers and wonderful human beings. So it's a, so like I say, a lot of the real talent isn't the star talent. It's the incredibly creative talent that's around. And like, exactly like you say, they're the people you really need to talk to because they're the ones that really have been through the mill. You know, I mean, I used to manage um, before he died, a guy called Tommy Boyce. You probably never heard of him. But Boyce and Hart create, did all the songs for the monkeys. They actually recorded them at the beginning. So all those last strange parts were all of that was Boyce and Hart. And again, you know, no one's heard of them. But you've heard of the monkeys, but they wouldn't have been there. They wouldn't have had a hit record, except for these guys writing a hit record every week for them. Every week, virtually, for each episode. And there's a huge lot of wonderful stories within that as well. Yeah, which I'd love to connect them. with that. There's, yeah, I, I just want to I talk think, to everybody. And I think, you know, it, it, seriously, if people started finding out these people, particularly the composers and songwriters, rather than just seeing the star or the series, if you look underneath it, you'll get all the real stories are sitting there. And they're much more interesting, usually, than the people that sang it or the people that did it. And, uh, and they're the people that create, you know, the, the, the longevity in the industry. Mm. Mostly, it's through the songs that are sitting there. So many so. stories out there <laughs> just waiting to be told. Yeah. And I, I, you know, those are the people you should grab onto, you know, while they're still like, around. Yeah. Because there are great people uh, uh, and um, they'd be happy to be interviewed, I'm sure, because no one ever wants to interview. Whoa! Because they never, we, they never think of, they don't expect to be interviewed. Uh, how do we because, make this happen? <laughs> well, there you go. It's up to you guys. <laughs> well, is there anything else that you would like me to ask you <laughs> or that you would want to share? Uh, well, the, the, apart from... I mean, you should check out April Rose Gabrielli with an eye at the end because she's tremendous. I'm also got a band called Anime's X with a, a Z for Anime's X, which is a really fun band. It started in Japan a few years ago. And the idea is taking the well-known children's songs and doing them hard rock. Yep. Um, these are four guys that everyone in the metal rock industry know uh, from Rudy Sarzo, uh, Mike Vassira, John Bruno and Adri, and they're incredible. And so imagine um, like from all the songs from Frozen done in hard rock. It makes you smile, it likes you. Right? The, the single we've got out now is Strawberry Fields, which again, is it's an incredible version. <laughs> and it's actually, I think, 43 on the airplay charts right now. And uh, so that, that's another fun thing for people to look at. Again, it's you know, it's it's something different. It's something creative, which I love. And they're they're going to do a lot of stage shows, particularly Christmas this year. Yeah, so, I actually yeah. just spoke with um, with Mike. Oh, Mike Vazira. Oh, just, fabulous. Well, so that's <laughs> what you were talking you all about. Them. Yeah, they, they, he's fun. The band's fun. And it's a it's a great thing. Nice. Well, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to to talk. It's so fun. And I just I feel like we I could just come over to your house and we could just hang out. And there you go. <laughs> I, it, just, it feels like we're, we're long lost friends already. <laughs> I say. <laughs> well, you have a great time. It's been a lot of fun. Great. And, you know, and the best of luck with everything you're doing. Thank and you. Come for us, say hello. So the way that I end my conversations is I give hugs. Hugs. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, take care. Because I'm stuck Hello. inside myself.